Welcome to the GCN Racing News Show. This week, the Tour Down Under, the Vuelta San Juan, the UCI Cyclocross World Cup finale, amateur lead outs, the first big sprint of the year for Vanderpool, the return of Chris Froome, and the best Chris Froome impersonation you've ever seen. We begin though with the first World Tour race of the year, the Tour Down Under. A race that is defined by sprints, bonus seconds, and Willunga Hill. The race kicked off with a sprint into Tenuda, and it was a bit of a relief for me after last week predicting that Sam Bennett would be the sprinter of 2020. The Irish champion was delivered perfectly towards the line by his De Kerning quick step teammates, and in particular Michael Morku to take his first win of the season and the first for his new team. That win for Sam Bennett means that he's now won at least one stage of 10 of the last 11 stage races in which he's competed. Impressive consistency to say the least. However, Caleb Ewan was the sprinter on top form. He had his moments of glory on stages two and four, and his turn of speed on both those finishes was seriously impressive. So if he continues like that this year, his sprint rival should be very worried indeed. Though he's also marked his 40th and 41st career victories and meant that Lotto Sudal's riders and staff could have a tipple or two. Uh, that team announced a no alcohol policy at the start of this year, except for celebrating wins, and by that point, they'd won more times than they hadn't. The other sprint stage win was taken by Team NTT Giacomo Nizzolo on the penultimate stage of the race. He was massively aided by teammate Ryan Gibbons, not by an impeccable lead out, but rather by a clever bit of slowing down. Just here look, which left a gap between the front riders and the favourites behind. Uh, Bennett came back incredibly fast, but it wasn't enough to stop the Italian taking his and his team's first win of the season. Uh, Caleb Ewan, in fact, had had a close call a little bit earlier on in that stage. Uh, apparently that instant down to the fact that he had one gel in one hand and the other slipped off the bars. I wouldn't want to have seen that chamois at the end of the stage. The general classification though was decided by the two hilltop finishes to Paracoom and Willunga. Richie Port took the first of those in impressive style. He clipped away on his own into a headwind, nobody able to follow. And that win means that Port has now won at least one stage of the Tour Down Under for seven consecutive years. The only other current pro who's done that in any race is Peter Sagan. He's won stages at the Tour of California eight years in a row and at the Tour de Suisse nine years in a row. Daryl Limpy, winner for the last two years for Mitchelton Scott, then took the leader's jersey courtesy of the bonus seconds that he picked up on the penultimate stage. And so it all came down to the grand finale yesterday. Stage six, Willunga Hill. A stage that Port has won for the last six years in a row. The guy owns that climb, but has often missed out on the GC due to bonus seconds. Quite the opposite happened this time around. Port didn't win the stage, but he did win the GC. He launched his huge trademark attack in the usual place. And you know it's a pretty phenomenal acceleration when somebody of the class of Simon Yates is on the wheel and then explodes completely. Port had soon caught and passed the remnants of a large early breakaway, except that there was one rider who refused to be dropped. Now you may never have heard of Matt Holmes before yesterday, but my goodness has he put his name on the map now. The 26-year-old Brit was in his first World Tour race, his first race in fact for Lotto Sudal, and had the audacity not only to stick to Port, but sprint past him before the line. I don't think there was one person watching who wasn't pleased to see Matt win, chapeau. Uh, Port though, despite coming second, had no reason to be disappointed. Not only had he done more than enough to take his first overall victory at the race since 2017, but he'd also, according to Matty Purali on Twitter, set the fastest ever time up that ascent. Now, critics of Port will point to the fact that he often appears to be in top shape in January, but then falls short at his big objective, the Tour de France in July. Now, we've trawled back through as far as we can go, and we can't find a Tour de France winner in recent times who's won a road race in January, and it may never have happened. That said, plenty of recent Tour de France winners have been winning races in the February of the year of their success. So I don't personally think that hitting your stride this early is a reason not to be on top form later in the year. After all, look back at last year where Primoz Roglic dominated almost every early season stage race, and then went on to smash it at the Vuelta in September. Anyway, we would very much like your opinion on this subject. Does Richie Port peak too early, or is there another reason for coming up short at the Tour de France? You can let us know by taking the poll over on the GCN app, there's a link to that in the description below, and by leaving your comments just down below this video. 
Before we finish with the Tour Down Under, I'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone out there who joined us for our live coverage here on GCN Racing, or indeed for the highlights, which we got up as soon as we possibly could after each and every stage. And also, in fact, to those of you who joined us for last night's opening stage of the Vuelta San Juan, which kicked off yesterday. It marks the 38th edition of the race, but it's really hit the headlines over the last three years, attracting some of the biggest named cyclists in the world. Amongst those competing this year are Peter Sagan, Julian Alaphilippe and Remco Evenepoel. Before the race even started, in fact, there was some serious sprinting going on. I absolutely love this video from UAE Team Emirates of their riders leading out some local riders. Memories for life there and possibly some riders of the future. They look pretty fast, don't they? The opening stage of the race from San Juan and back into San Juan was marred by a huge crash just outside three kilometres to go. Even a Paul Sepulveda and Sevilla were amongst those involved, but the commissaires decided to give everybody the same time after reviewing footage that showed it was a spectator who caused the pile-up. Emerging unscathed was Rudy Barbier in his first race for the Israel startup nation. He took some big scalps there too, with Sagan, Hodge and Gaviria further down the top ten. The race continues later tonight with what looks set to be another chance for the sprinters. Now don't forget that we have got daily live coverage worldwide excluding Europe and Latin America. If you're in Europe, you can catch the race live over on Eurosport. Alternatively, we've got highlights in Europe right here on GCN Racing. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and also click on that bell notification icon so that you get an alert every time we go live with the race or upload our highlights. Your company will be very much appreciated. Over to the dirt now and to the final round of the UCI Telenet Cyclocross World Cup. A lot rests on the outcome of the women's race, with just five points separating Céline Del Carmen Alvarado and Anne-Marie Borst in the overall standings. And so, unsurprisingly, those two were locked together for almost the entire race. Neither wanted to let the other out of their sights. But it wasn't just those two, Evie Richards, Lucinda Brandt, Sanna Kant and Yala Castellan were also up there in the front group. Then with just a few hundred metres to go, Alvarado was in a great position leading the race with Brandt between her and Verst and then, just as she looked to be sailing away with it, disaster struck. A small mistake on one of the off-camber sections proved to be the most costly of her whole career. It's heartbreaking to watch in fact. Blanche took advantage to take the race win, whilst Vorst could coast in in second place knowing that she would win the overall title. Shit happens, as they say, but whilst I'm sure Vorst would have rather won in a different way, not making mistakes is a big part of all bike racing, so you have to say she's the deserving World Cup winner this year. Ominously, Sana Kant, who hasn't had the best of seasons, managed to finish in third place. I say ominously, she tends to come good for the World Championships and with those coming up in Switzerland this coming weekend, it appears she may have timed her form to perfection. Also, good luck if you're a junior competing against Shirin van Anroy for the World Championship title this weekend. She finished seventh in the elite race on the day. In the men's, things were a little more clear-cut in the overall standings, with Tonart looking odds-on to take his second consecutive World Cup title. But the win in the final round was still up for grabs. The fast course meant we had a very large group up front, while Van Aert managing to get himself amongst them despite starting near the back of the grid. It was a matter of time though before Van der Poel attacked, wasn't it? That came on lap 6 of 10 and he was never seen again. In finishing second, Arch did more than enough to win the overall World Cup. He may not have won a round this year, but his consistency paid off with a clear margin of victory over Ellie Isabet in second. Leading up to last weekend, Van der Poel had been on a warm weather training camp with Tim Merlier and Jonas Rijkaard amongst others. And here is some footage from Jonas of Van der Poel and Merlier sprinting flat out at the end of a long endurance ride. Some serious power going through the pedals there, I bet. Uh, don't forget Merlier is in fact the Belgian national road champion, a race that ended in a bunch sprint, which he won of course. In other news, it was great to see Lachlan Morton and Mitch Docker of EF Education First being proactive in raising money for the bushfire relief in Australia. They both agreed to shave their heads if more than $5,000 was donated, and they duly delivered on their promise. Docker even shaved his trademark moustache off too. They are now standing at over $8,000, so if you would like to contribute, you can find a link to their GoFundMe page in the description just down below. Chris Froome of Team Ineos has announced where he will make his return to competition after that horrific crash before the Dauphiné last year. It will be at the UAE Tour at the end of February. 
Whether or not though it will give us any insight into his current form is another matter. It's a race which is quite easy to ride if you just stay in the peloton and decided by a couple of key climbs that come at the end of stages. If he doesn't make an effort on those, we'll be none the wiser as to how his rehab has gone. Speaking of fruit, he was spotted here in the team cars at the Tour Down Under. That, of course, is not Froome, but rather his new teammate Rowan Dennis doing his best impersonation. And what an impressive impression that is. Do you think you can do better? We would love to see your best Chris Froome riding impersonations. And in fact, you can upload them to the GCN Inspiration part of the GCN app. We'll show the best ones this time next week. Use the hashtag GCN Froome. Meanwhile, the Tour of Oman, which was scheduled to take place just before the UAE Tour, has been cancelled. This is due to the death of Sultan Qaboos. The country will observe a 40-day mourning period. Back to cyclocross now, and after gaining selection for the World Cyclocross Championships, three-time world champion Wout van Aert would be left disappointed, along with, I'd imagine, the Belgian selectors, because potentially he will be starting on the third and maybe even the fourth row of the grid. This is due to his lack of cyclocross racing over the past few months and therefore results and it will leave him with a considerable amount of work to do to get to the front of the race this coming Sunday in Switzerland. A bronze medalist last year, it's difficult to look past Van der Poel defending his title but if the European Championships are anything to go by, the Belgians will give it a good go. OK, who misses this team jersey in the top flight of the pro peloton? Well, it might be back at the top of the sport and on your TV screens very soon. The Fundation Escadie project team had its launch last week and they've strong ambitions to get back to the top of the sport, which will be absolutely fantastic to see. Not only do they have a continental pro team now, but they've also got a women's and an under-23 team. And to make it even better, they use Etche Ondo clothing and Orbea bikes, both of course historic manufacturers from the Basque Country. Mikel Lander of Bari McLaren is the president of the team, which this year will have the Azulia Tour of the Basque Country as its main goal. And in other good news, Yolanda Neff last week tweeted a video of herself riding a bike again, which is a lot quicker than I was expecting her to after that horrific crash she had a couple of weeks ago whilst training. And now for something a bit different. The US Gravel and Adventure season kicked off yesterday with the Grasshopper Adventure Series in low gap. Pete Stetner, Lawrence Ten Dam, Jeff Kabush, Alison Tetrick and Katie Hall were amongst the luminaries taking part. The first half of the 43 mile event was predominantly on asphalt, whilst the second half almost entirely unpaved, making equipment choice crucial. With Kate Courtney a no-show, there was a clear winner in the women's race in the form of Katie Hall riding for Bulls Dulmans. She came home close to 10 minutes clear of second-placed Lauren Cantwell. The men's race, though, really couldn't have been more closely fought. Stetner, on a Canyon gravel bike, had been locked together with last year's winner Sandy Florin on his mountain bike, but rather ironically, the latter was victim into a puncture in the closing stages, and so Stetner started the final seven-mile descent with a decent advantage. Florin, though, would manage to catch back on, and there were 1k to go. Kabush, who'd set his bike up with that final descent in mind, had managed to close a three-minute gap, and he got the better of both of them to take the win. Doesn't get much tighter than that in the world of gravel racing. Right, before we finish, are you organising or part of an event or race that's just a little bit different from the world of top-level road racing? If you are, we would love to hear from you. Each week here on the GCN Racing News Show, we're making a concerted effort to feature all racing and not just World Tour. And we know there are some amazing races out there, so make sure you share them with us. You can reach me directly, in fact, on dan at globalcyclingnetwork.com if you think you've got one that warrants the GCN Racing Report. That is all for this week's G's and Racing News Show. Don't forget to join us for the Vuelta San Juan if you're able to. And we'll be back next week with all the news from that race, plus the UCI Cyclocross World Championships. In the meantime, if you would like to see what a day in the life of a pro rider looks like when they're on a training camp, Oli took a break from the velodrome to go and visit AG2R. You can find that video just down here.